Welcome, everybody. Welcome to what we could call the final evening of Eindhoven Caucus. For many of us, it's kind of uh, actually after a week's break, fantastic to see so many faces back again. People I thought were totally in my life constantly for three weeks I started to miss desperately, so welcome back. And for many new faces, welcome here to the Van Abba Museum at Eindhoven for the Eindhoven Caucus. This is indeed the last evening of uh, the Eindhoven Caucus, but of course we hope, uh, aside from being a kind of ending of a colossal undertaking of organization, but also wonderful debates and uh, thinking and, and, and the exposition of practices, I hope indeed it's a beginning. It's a beginning of a new step in our process of, of thinking through the project Becoming Dutch. As many of you know, this project is a two-year project, which uh, began in uh, January of this year. It's a project run by the Fanabi Museum, but which has many, many partners, many welcome partners who help us think through and problematize the idea of what on earth this thing in Northern Europe at this moment could be, in, um, which might be thinking about the normalization of identity, the idea of assimilization, assimilation and uh, integration. How are we thinking about these kind of processes and the kind of governmental imperatives that make us think like this? Could we explode or, or rethink the notion of becoming, but also of, of being Dutch? These are the kind of enterprises that we've been trying to think through over the last year um, and, and of course constantly trying to relocate these things or locate them in the here and now of the Netherlands but also by inviting wonderful and important voices from throughout the world to kind of think with us about the immediate and urgent uh, questions of how we might live together better and how we might think through our sense of community and our sense of difference, our contradictions and our possibilities of thinking through how we might have agency in contemporary society today. And of course for us the, the, the trope or the question of the caucus is always one that again can be constantly problematized and opened out. It's, a, it's a, 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 an idea of meeting and thinking through the notion of, of making decisions and deciding on policy in a very kind of pragmatic political way and whether we as artists and, and thinkers in the artistic field might play a role in such uh, processes or might comment on them or might question them or open them out. And so for us the, the notion of the caucus is a kind of provocation or a kind of trope that we need to re-examine and see whether it's something we could own or not necessarily reinvent but occupy certainly in some kind of useful way. It's an enormous pleasure to, to um, introduce our guest, as I said, maybe the final guest of the caucus, but somebody I hope who will open up so many thoughts and processes for, for us uh, today. And that is uh, Professor Gyatri Chakravorty Spivak, who's come all the way from uh, New York uh, to be with us tonight. Um, Professor Spivak was with us in Cork and, and really enunciated very many important uh, problematics and questions for us at that moment and we were really really honored and delighted to have her back. We think and I'm sure many do and know that she's at the forefront of post-colonial studies, feminism, comparative literature and works in translation, an extraordinary th thinker, teacher and reader of texts. She's now university professor at Columbia University in New York. I would like to welcome uh, Professor, professor Spivak who will give a talk today called Alter Globalization and Conceptual Art. Welcome and thank you. Let's get organized here. Thank you so much, Annie. That was very nice, uh, wonderful introduction. You've had some great speakers, yes? So uh, I'll probably not, first of all, not say anything new at all, but that's okay. It bears repetition, some of these things that we think together. But also, uh, is the mic catching? Yeah. Okay. Great. You can all hear me, right? Uh, also, um, I may be a little bit, uh, there's not enough room on this thing, is there? I may be a little too old-fashioned, actually. I'm a bit textual. I'm a literary critic. And that sometimes I forget that not everyone is. So I hope you will bear with me as I move through these texts. 
And um, have you had, in fact, the names you mentioned, Homi, Paul, Gobina, uh, and who else with Gobina? Um, Nikos, Nikos. Nikos, right. So you haven't had a woman yet. Oh, no, we have. Who is this? You had shot that, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. That doesn't matter. I'm not a genitalist. But um, nonetheless, okay, well, this is really, okay. I'll do what I can, all right? Um, a bit Chaplin-esque here. All right, so I want to begin with a dead dog. Um, the, uh, there had, you know, Bamako is a film that I said I, I would comment on, yes? And um, as many of you know, how many of you ha have actually seen the film? Not too many, okay. Uh, the, there was in Bamako a, a meeting of the uh, World Social Forum, which is Alter Globalization. And I hope I'm able to talk about alter globalization because you've given me 40 minutes and I may not be able to, but then there's a good Q&A, so we might be able to talk about it then. But anyway, the, there had been a, uh, uh, um, a, a meeting of the World Social Forum in Bamako and Abderrahman Sisako's uh, film was, was just after, came out just after that. And so there is, I believe, a comment on, uh, on uh, alter globalization in the film. Now, as I say, I want to begin with the dead dog. The film opens with a dead dog. Here it is. Why? I mean, one doesn't know why, okay? Or one might know. We'll see. Okay, so um, the, my idea is that we should think about the last sentence of Kafka's um, uh, process, the um, trial, when we look at this dead dog. And I'll tell you why. Uh, you know what those, that famous, famous um, sentence, right? It's like, I'll read it in English. Where was the judge whom he had never seen? Joseph, these are the last, last sentences, he's dying. Where was the judge whom he had never seen? Where was the high court to which he had never penetrated? He raised his hands and spread out all his fingers. But the hands of one of the partners were already at Kay's throat, while the other thrust the knife deep into his heart and turned it there twice. With failing eyes, Kay could still see the two of them immediately before him, cheek leaning against cheek, kind of funny, clownish figures, cheek leaning against cheek, watching the final act, like in a play. They're themselves killing him, of course, but they're watching it like the working out of a play. Watching the final act, like a dog, he said, it was as if the shame of it must outlive him. This is the last sentence, very famous sentence. Of, and you remember, those of you who have seen Bamako, that Bamako is about a trial. Hmm? And so this is the last, um, the World Bank is on trial in Bamako, the IMF and World Bank. Okay, so, um, here, this last page, of course, as we know, a tubercular youngish man, Kafka is in his uh, 40s, he's on the verge of death, and he is, uh, he is at the same time requesting his friend, it's an extremely well-known um, story, to burn his manuscripts, and this is a kind of a double-bind request, as people have noticed. I mean, you don't burn them yourself, but you leave a testamentary. This is a, totally an example of a double-bind, yes? Now, the... Kafka's text, as you must all know, is about the double bind between natural and positive law. And that the grounding death drive of natural law cannot be continuous with positive law. You see, because when we want to be political, we are thinking about positive law as that which will solve the problem of the world. You can, problems of the world, you can call this death drive of natural law, which cannot be continuous with positive law, Archive fever, that's what that entire argument is about. 
So in a sense, you have to think about this because when you do this kind of top-down good to all the suffering world, etc., and you're very sort of uh, cozy with them and so on, you forget that there is a certain kind of what Levinas would call objectness which you share with them. Okay, it is also, the t novel is also about the necessity and impossibility of individual exceptionalism. Something that the modern and postmodern vision of art has not been able to circumvent. When you say, as you do, and I quote, art has become an active space, I believe you have to ignore the world. I can't talk about this now because of the 40 minute stuff, but I hope it, uh, you will ask me something about this. In the trial, the artist offers a choice that is no choice. The priest offers Kafka's own parable of before the law, and I'm assuming that this is a great classic that you have all read. The, uh, the priest offers Kafka's own parable of before the law as an iteration, about which the parable, not the iteration, Derrida says that it is the unique event which can be repeated as difference, and it thus points toward singularity as the universalizable. Singularity as the universalizable, not particular, not individual, the universalizable. That the difference that can be repeated, iteration. That's what uh, Derrida sees that parable as. If the dog opens Bamako and closes the trial, it is at the textual center of James Kutsia's disgrace. A novel about the terrible burden of postcoloniality. And you know, he, after that novel, because he was a truth teller rather than a politically correct uh, white pro-black um, uh, pro uh, activist who then doesn't quite know what to do after uh, the apartheid is lifted, he, was, uh, he couldn't, he couldn't uh, really withstand the pressures and he left. But anyway, let us quickly read the father-daughter exchange that rewrites great European texts, King Lear and the trial, faced with the results of colonial brutality. Okay, I, it, it, has anybody here read my article in Diacritics on uh, this uh, novel, Disgrace? Good, no one. Oh, one person, very good. I quote there, I quote there Tagore's great lines, um, Unfortunate country written in the 1920s. Those whom you have disgraced, the caste system, oppression, that kind of stuff for centuries. Europe doesn't hold a candle to what we have done. That's another reason why I can't just go on talking about electronic Europe. So uh, the, uh, he continues, those whom you have disgraced in this way, and he uses the phrase human rights, Manushir Odhikar, and this is written in 1920, I think. Uh, th those whom you have deprived of human rights, you have, uh, you have kept them standing in front of you, but you have not given them any space in your, in your arms. You will have to be the same as they are in death in the ashes of burning bodies. This is not a cry about, please give human rights to the deprived. This is a very mysterious and extremely strange uh, poem. And uh, so uh, when I was writing on Kutsie, I was actually quoting this, but at any rate, here is the exchange in Kutsie, which is so, the dead dog is at the beginning in Bamako, at the end in Kafka, and at the textual center, if not the narrative center, in um, disgrace. Here is the, um, the, the woman, the lesbian daughter, who has been raped and is pregnant, and the um, English uh, literature teacher father, uh, they're talking to each other, and she has decided that she will give the land up, she'll bear the child, and so on and so forth. I can't tell, I mean, obviously most of you have read the story. So this is the father and the daughter speaking. How humiliating, he says finally. Such high hopes and to end like this. This is a post-colonial situation seen from the point of view of the good urban radical whites, okay? 
How hum humiliating, he says finally. Such high hopes and to end like this. Yes, I agree, she says. It is humiliating. But perhaps that is a good point to start from again. Perhaps that is what I must learn to accept, to start at ground level. You remember this prediction. You will have to be the same as what you made them in violence and in disgrace, in the ashes of burnt bodies, not just doing good. So um, to start at ground level with nothing, and she's, this is, of course, could see her working on King Lear. You remember where this is father-daughter, right? And uh, Cordelia says, nothing, my lord. And he says, nothing will come of nothing. And so it goes. With nothing, not with nothing, but with nothing. No cards, no weapons, no property, no rights, talking about where they were, right? Equal in disgrace, no cards, no weapons, no property, no rights, no dignity. That's what I must learn to accept, says she. Like a dog, he says. And uh, she says, yes, like a dog. As you know, in disgrace, the hero goes on to redefine a dog's death, very Christian. So the, the, the dog becomes anthropomorphized and so on and so forth, but that's another story. But let us, let us turn to Bamako and see how Sisako touches on a similar theme by way of intertextuality. By intertextuality, I mean simply, you know, I always, when I say text, as you know, I've said, said it a million times, I think about a weave and not a verbal text, the, the Latin verb, texere, from which comes textile, for example, so that the verbal text is itself a second level metaphor, right? So intertextuality is where texts are, are braided together, as it were, so that one text gets something from the other and also gives something to itself. So that's what's happening here with this, uh, this dead dog. At the, um, so let's see what he does. And if the idea of a post-national world is to succeed, there must be intertextuality going in both directions, not just the global south rewriting Europe, or the benevolent global north blindly rewarding identitarianism. See, this is something that one really has to think through, the uh, diversity on the other side. So this is intertextuality we weaving together so that both sides are affected, are, is harmed both by only us writing, you know, Buchi Amicheta rewriting Agamemnon, and here um, Sisako rewriting Kafka and other stuff. I mean, he's doing more than that, but nonetheless, if it's going to be, and I'll talk about that more, I mean, I don't quite know exactly when, but I will. Um, um, th there has to be the parity there, and that's an extremely difficult project. At any rate, it is on the threshold of the dead dog, intertextually, perhaps recalling the death of European exceptionalism that the film begins. Sisako gives us another signal. The man who sees the dead dog kills himself at the end of the film. Again, it's not really very strongly a part of the film's story. The film's story is the trial of the, of the IMF, so that uh, the World Bank, so that this frame thing, a dead dog in the beginning, and the guy killing himself, that same guy who sees it killing himself at the end, this is really not integrally a part of the text, except as a, therefore it's not a narrative signal, it's a textual signal, right? Because in, in, uh, in uh, the trial, of course, in the previous paragraph, that's what Kay says he ought to be able to do, but he cannot do. He can't take the knife and put it in his own breast. Sisako, to an extent, dismisses that entire narrative as a narrative which belongs to the story of, it's a, it's a pretty dismissive thing, the, belongs to the story of the exceptionalist young suffering European intellectual in his sense of confronting the, uh, the, uh, the positive, the double bind between a cruel natural law that does not acknowledge civil society and the state because they are held up by positive law. Sisako puts that to the ground and shows us another text. Now let's, let's linger on the, on the film for a moment. Now I'll show the other clips. First of all, the uh, symbol, as you know, it's a symbolic trial of the World Bank, 
And Sisako places two persons, first is the dead dog, then he places two persons outside the frame. The charismatic female singer who would travel easily into the musical circle of global protest, the sort of alter globalizing use of this, uh, the, the artists from the global south without very much sense of the historical, okay? They, uh, they are used in that way. Sisako puts her out, outside of the frame and he also puts out the traditional healer. So this is the two ends of the spectrum. One person who is easily taken into, I mean, this is something that those of us, I mean, I'm not a charismatic young singer, but nonetheless, you know, when one is at UN conventions and so on and so forth, I, we are quite often just dragged forward as South Asia, you know, uh, South Asia, South Asia press conferences. I'm not South Asia, I'm sorry. So the, this kind of thing, the idea of using, uh, this is the person who is put outside, but at the other end of the spectrum, the person who is put outside of this is the traditional healer. Let's look at two clips. And this is, see what she'll do is the way she's, she's put out is she'll interfere with the thing, uh, with the, she won't let the trial start. She calls and you see what happens and then the trial will start. She's having her dress laced up. Okay. Now the second one here, the second one happens like this. The traditional healer wants to come and he's told not, not to come because it's, not, it's not, ti not his time yet. I'm sorry I don't have the subtitles because there's a really ra rather a nice, a nice discourse he gives, like the hen has words, but the goat has words too, and both must be heard, and so on. Does anyone in the audience understand this? Then maybe you will tell us, because the words are very beautiful. I couldn't. So it's African on African, right? This is not a black-white thing. So he, and the guy says, d'accord, merci, and he goes, and now the films, the credit comes on. See, so um, first the dead dog, and then these two. Now I sh will show, I used, I generally showed a clip of the woman singing, but I think I'm, I'm probably going to take too long, so I'll skip that one. Because she's a very forceful presence in the film, although not as part of the trial. As I said, she's put out outside. In, at the trial, the participating Africans have achieved sufficient continuity with the European Enlightenment to be able to criticize its travesty. You see, sometime in their critics, the Africans are criticizing the World Bank, but these are Africans who are continuous with the European Enlightenment so that they can forcefully, in a continuous way, criticize its travesty. These are the southern participants in the World Social Forum, let us say. I cannot speak for the rest of the world, but I certainly can speak for India, and I will say that they're radicals full of moral outrage, but indeed they also have within them remnants of feudality which have not been, uh, which have not disappeared. So to an extent it is, and again, I may not be able to speak about alter globalization, but it's a kind of coming back of the feudal mode, it's almost as if welfare state socialism and international communism were blips on the historical, on the historical plane, okay? And then what's coming back, and that made, I mean, someone needs to write an 18th Brumaire of the Bolshevik, Bolshevik Revolution and China. So it almost made it possible for the uh, capital to come into its own, and then what we are seeing again with the self-selected moral entrepreneurship of the international civil society, 
wanting to work without a social contract, what we are seeing is really a return of, and this of, there's a, a fundraising culture, we, a kind of return of benevolent feudalism without, you know, some of the terrible things. It's a displaced return, but nonetheless, we have to think about that. We, it, we don't like it very much because it's much more convenient to do good this way, but if you think about it, then perhaps you will agree with me. So in that context, the ones who, those of us who become accepted into these situations are very much continuous with the European tradition that we quite correctly criticize. I mean, there's, I have no problem with that, but I'm just saying that Sisako shows us that. So I will now show, I won't show her singing. I, I will show two clips in succession. Please note the difference in the response. Sisako distinguishes carefully. First, the good white guy testifying against the World Bank. He speaks in metaphors, you know, sublier, Africain, etc. You know, like this, the African ram and so on and so forth. Like that. And the audience is shown responding collectively. And next, uh, he shows the black woman testifying. Now, she's also good. She's good. She's a powerful speaker. But she is less eloquent and she speaks statistics. The, there, uh, she says other things, but generally speaking, she speaks uh, statistics, and the response is very different from the other two. And I say this because Sisako is not saying this to say the white guy is better. You know, what he's trying to show here is the we so often think of the uh, think of all of this as you know, like Africa must be a continuous. Now, what is happening here? Come on, man, go. Yes. Uh, the um, Africa is a kind of continuous good space, and it is a good space, fine. But what he's doing is he's also giving it a certain kind of diversity, which is not like the diversity that we so, so celebrate in the metropole. In the metropole, the diversity is basically with those who are continuous or being made continuous as they should be. And there, I mean, one of the things that one feels like saying, and I've quoted this guy many a time, and he spoke at Davos in this way, the um, former director of the ILO, he did say that if the, if the uh, political economy of global capital changed a little, you wouldn't have so much migration. So yes, of course, you want to be good to migrants and so on and so forth, becoming Dutch, you know, born, being Dutch, becoming Dutch. But on the other hand, if you look at the whole world, the world doesn't end in uh, migrated, the, met, uh, the migrated metropolis. And his point was not, he was not played over the loop, just once. All the ones who made benevolent cultural noises were played over and over again, but not this guy. Remember, this wasn't even politics. This was political economy. There is a difference. So um, it's, we come now to those two, the white guy and then the black woman. Let me see. Les critiques que courageusement on a entendu il y a quelques instants du côté de la barre. Alors oui, vous allez déclarer coupable la Banque mondiale d'avoir abusé de la confiance du peuple africain. Oui, vous allez déclarer coupable la Banque mondiale de non-assistance à peuple en danger. Oui, vous allez déclarer coupable la Banque mondiale de ne pas avoir respecté son mandat d'origine, c'est-à-dire servir l'humanité. Et ce faisant, Vous allez réouvrir la voie de l'utopie que chacun de nous voit de l'œil intérieur qui permet de dessiner un monde nouveau derrière les collines. L'utopie qui est en quelque sorte ce bélier africain qui vient, qui vient se frotter et déchirer le froc de la raison d'État du marché. L'utopie demain pour éviter ce qui se prépare dans les banlieues d'Accra d'Abidjan et du Caire, c'est-à-dire que des gamins ivres de pauvreté et de souffrance se demain se transforment en boules de feu. Vous allez donc déclarer coupable la Banque mondiale de redevenir une banque de l'humain. Hush, come on man, don't do this to me. See, I'm not so good with these things. I shall ask. Okay, there we go. <laughs> All right. Now comes the uh, black woman here. Monsieur le Président, l'ajustement est un mal, un mal organisé, structuré, administré et inoculé à nos peuples. 
Ce mal, Monsieur le Président, c'est le cynisme de la dette, le cycle vicieux de la dette, cette dette qui a fini de ruiner nos économies et qui nous a aspiré toutes nos forces vitales alors qu'on n'a pas encore fini de payer. Que faut-il faire devant la violence de la dette J'entends les latino-américains. Ils nous ont dit, Monsieur le Président, la dette est tout simplement impayable. Oui, Monsieur le Président, elle est impayable parce qu'elle est illégitime. Elle est impayable parce qu'elle est violente. Elle est impayable parce que tout simplement, elle est insoutenable. À la violence de la dette vient s'ajouter le bradage de nos biens publics, de nos services publics, de nos services sociaux de base, la privatisation. Après avoir privatisé la santé, alors que entre juin et septembre 2005, 42 000 personnes sont mortes du choléra, cette maladie du Moyen Âge qu'on croyait à jamais éradiquer de nos villes et de nos campagnes. Mais qu'on n'aille pas plus loin, Monsieur le Président. Ici, dans cette chambre, j'ai et j'ai mis un malade. Entendez-vous sa complainte Elle m'est parvenue aux oreilles et nous privatisons la santé. Ce n'est pas fini. On privatise l'éducation. Conçue comme un droit universel, l'acquisition du savoir et de la connaissance, qui doit être la chose la mieux partagée. Pendant que deux tiers de nos enfants sont analphabètes, on nous demande de payer pour acquérir le savoir et la connaissance. Ce n'est pas fini, Monsieur le Président. On a privatisé, on a bradé nos services publics. Comment privatiser l'eau, Monsieur le Président Le Djoliba, le Sénégal, le Zambèze, le Limpopo, nos fleuves privatisés avec nos contes, nos légendes, nos traditions, enfouis dans les courants, dans les rivières et dans nos lacs Cela n'est pas admissible. Ce peuple, c'est la veuve qui pleure la mort prématurée de son mari, enfouie sous les décombres de l'ajustement. Ce peuple, c'est l'orphelin qui réclame le sein de sa mère, emporté dans les couches, alors qu'il exigeait tout simplement un dû, les soins primaires de santé. Ce peuple, Monsieur le Président, c'est le père de famille, ce compressé du rail, ces messieurs que vous avez entendus, ces dames qui vous ont supplié à votre barre. Le père de famille qui a vu son autorité, qui a vu son influence, qui a vu sa dignité diluée et emportée par un licenciement injuste. Ce peuple, Monsieur le Président, c'est enfin Zegé Bamba. Avez-vous, Monsieur le Président, entendu la complainte de Zegé Bamba okay. now, now, the traditional healer, he comes back. Now, I want us to look very carefully at this, because this is not an identitarian film. Someone, in fact, Alex Asiman at NYU, When I showed this to him, he didn't understand this at all. He's a man of great subtlety. And he says, well, so, okay, he's saying good things, right? So what's the point? And I had told him before that we don't know what he says. And if Mama Dudiouf is correct, most in the audience also don't know uh, what he says. There's no subtitle on this part. He's, so he could very well be speaking only about the fact that procedurally he's been left out. That we have no idea whether this is good or bad. This is the moment of the double bind. This is the indecisive moment. This is not an identitarian moment. There's no way that Sisako is saying, we must go back to the traditional healer. There is nothing of that there. But we do see he's given uh, pride of place. It could also be that he's saying something appropriate. But we cannot know. It can't be caught within this discursive formation. I wrote an essay long, long ago in 93 called Responsibility. I don't think I have a great readership in this audience, but um, has anybody by any chance it came out in Boundary 2, at least there's one person who's read it. Well, one for the one, one for the other, not too bad. See, there, what I was writing about was the fact that uh, I was uh, main uh, spokesperson for the flood action program, the critics of the flood action program in Bangladesh at the European Parliament, where the World Bank and all of the donor countries, including Holland, had come so that we could actually establish the critique and see if we couldn't dislodge the World Bank, somewhat like what in the film. But um, there was one guy who had been brought 
to be the representative of the people, okay? And uh, my entire uh, uh, piece is about how it was absolutely impossible to catch this guy in, in a dignified way within the, I mean, there was nothing but embarrassment and finally uh, people didn't really listen to him at all because there was no simultaneous translation provided about Bangladesh, no Bengali translation. So no simultaneous translation provided, the person who was translating was just a good-hearted young person who was doing a nonsense out of it and so it was like no one paid any attention to him, right? That if you are interested in this, take a look. But obviously this is a film and that was a, an actual session of the European Parliament, so it won't be, I'm not saying the one, the one and the other are the same, but Sisako's presentation of the traditional healer is orchestrated to show that he's not caught in it, but that doesn't make him necessarily good. That's necessarily bad. He's just outside. There is some, and he wants to be creolized to speak and so on and so forth, but he's not there. We don't know if he's good or bad. I had a student who in the 60s, I've been teaching for a very long time, when asked to uh, define what she meant by radical, uh, she said, well, you know, uh, any uh, thing that makes people shut the door on your nose. And I said, no, that's not a good, you know, like Frederick Jameson's definition of subalternity, when you have a feeling of inferiority, no, those are not good definitions. You have to have some content in these things. And so what I'm trying to say is that the traditional healer is so staged that he is not just good and he cannot be just bad. He is not understood. He is also, on the other hand, his mode is not unlike the mode of the trial. Here he comes. also slightly long, just as the white is slightly long. Okay, actually, now contrast this to the much more innocent and open response to the African Western, a film within a film. This too is discontinuous with the trial, okay? There's no problem with this response at all. <laughs> this is part of the film. He shot one and two fell. <laughs> Danny Glover, obviously. It's scary, <laughs> Okay. Now, the, there are no white women in the film. No global feminist solidarity, as is evident at the World Social Forums. Gender is the alibi for the entire spectrum of good and bad globalizing intervention. Has a criticism been represented here in the working of the screen? For Sisako takes good care to represent the bond among unevenly creolizing Malian women. I only showed the, uh, the ones who are continuous with the Africans, but there's a lot of different sorts of women who come up who are less understood, more understood, uh, not understood. He really does show a whole spectrum. It's, there's no criticism of just the ones who are the judges and so on, but there are no white women at all. And the implicit possibility of a male solidarity is clearly shown across the color class line where the black African has achieved rational epistemic continuity with the white European. 
When Maître Rapaport, incidentally an actual person, interrupts on the side of the prosecution, this, I mean, I, because he was uh, accused of anti-Semitism and because his name is Rapaport, this guy's name, and so uh, Sisako said that there was actually a guy like that in the World Bank and so that's whom he was talking about. Um, interrupts on the side of the prosecution, this is what his white colleague says to him, not waiting for procedure. This is a very quick one, okay, so take a quick look. Autorité victime, la juge. Taisez-vous. Maître Rapaport. Taisez-vous. Shut up. Maître Rapaport. Okay, so that's what he says. When he addresses the court, when Rapaport addresses the court, this is what the men active in the village world of unofficial micro governance do. Okay, so this is what the guy says in the macro story, and this is what the the people, uh, the the village people. Gosh, come on, don't do this. Don't. Okay, do, <laughs> when, please contrast this to world governance, also without waiting for procedure. Okay. On meurt de diarrhée en Afrique. This is that on guy meurt speaking. du paludisme depuis longtemps, et ça n'est pas notre responsabilité, mais on continue à en mourir. Et quelqu'un a pu dire, les médicaments sont au nord et les malades sont au sud. Même si nous étions guidés que par des intérêts égoïstes, nous ne pouvons pas vouloir rechercher de tels objectifs, et c'est pourtant, et nous le savons. Et nous le savons pourquoi Parce que nous avons contribué avec, en coopération avec les gouvernements, à faire un état des lieux pour déterminer ce qu'il convient maintenant. Il faut tout de même. So you see, the white guy says to the same guy, the bad guy, bad World Bank guy, taisez-vous, shut up. And the black guys outside just simply uh, unhook uh, the loudspeaker. So th this is again, remember, this is not a narrative line. This is a kind of textual connection. But nonetheless, there is a certain uh, signal toward the, a possible male solidarity, but it's very, very clear that there, is, there are no white women here at all. So the, uh, now comes the question. Okay, I mean, one can go into questions of reproductive heteronormativity, uh, uh, all of this stuff. But the real question that I have to ask is, who can access this intertextuality? There is no doubt that Sisako is working in this way. I like the film, it's a bit romantic, but it's a wonderful film. But the real question comes, who can access this intertextuality? And in even, I'm not just saying that the uh, Global South can't. I mean, at my university, Joseph Stiglitz, who's a very, very well-educated person after all, and very active in the Clinton government, critic of the IMF, and so on, a, a totally policy-oriented guy. This is the problem. Bottom and top, both need to be educated. He saw this simply as a documentary about the critique, uh, criticism of the IMF. Whereas, I believe, what Sisako was trying to show was, to an extent, a kind of difference between resistance and the people. The, that and, this, and he begins and ends with that dismissal of also European exceptionalism. And so it seems to me that the question needs to be asked, who can access this intertextuality? And then we are into the problem of the disappearance of the state. Now, I don't know if I can actually take you into, I've done uh, 40 minutes, so I've got five minutes. So let me just say, let me just say, well, maybe I should just kind of finish and then you, we can talk. Let me just say, as I often do, what it is that I would have done and say a word about Santiago and then we can, it'll be easier if you can talk. I mean, I'm just silent, I'm just talking and you people are sitting silently watching my face. God knows what you're thinking. The clips were pretty long. At any rate, the, so I would like to actually uh, talk about this and, uh, and go into alter globalization uh, with no transition beyond two quotations, one from Marx and one from Antonio Gramsci. Marx's is, is from the thesis on Feuerbach, where he says, where he talks about the, the fact that there are, there is a division, a superior and an inferior, when the, when education takes place. This is not, not about class. This is not about class. This is the materialist doctrine concerning the changing of circumstances and upbringing 
upbringing, okay, forgets that circumstances are changed by people and that it is essential to educate the educator. The doctrine must therefore divide society into two parts, one of which is superior. The, uh, this idea, one of which is superior to society, he writes, this idea, and I can't get into it here, I hope to be able to write this soon, the idea of the double bind of vanguardism, which cuts across Marx, Lenin, Trotsky, Mao, Rosa Luxemburg, Gramsci, Du Bois, you name it, the idea of the situation within education, which can very, very easily be alleviated by good talk. Nobody who has ever taught will, in, in fact, in the privacy of his or her boudoir, indulge such talk at all. It's, we give in to it because it sounds bad otherwise, but the, the problem of the double bind of vanguardism and the ways in which vanguardism is undermined, not so much by some, more by others, that's the, that's the situation that uh, would give us a transition to alter globalization. Now, I will then, to in, in when you know the speech on alter globalization, which I, um, to which is a speech I gave in Paris. There, I talk about ATAC, about which I'm sure here in Europe you are very well aware. Perhaps there are some members of ATAC here. I talk about ATAC. I talk about the fact of the Tobin tax. The, I talk about the fact that ATTAC, the French thing that started from Le Monde Diplomatique and then went to Brazil, supposedly by their own account, they formed the World Social Forum. But I suggest that that may be the efficient cause, but the other cause, the necessary, the big cause, might be the, uh, the failure of both state and revolution that it was time for this kind of a thing to emerge because of these two failures. Now, the Gramsci passage, you know, Marx talks about those two, uh, the, that there has, to be, uh, um, there has to be an awareness that one part is superior to the other part in society when you're talking about educating and especially educating the educators. And he says, therefore, this coincidence of the changing of circumstances can be conceived and rationally understood only as revolutionary practice. This is very, very different from the idea of revolution as a violent overthrow of a certain form of government. And here Marx is talking about the fact that without the practice of freedom, receiving so-called independence does not lead to anything. And Gramsci writes in his extraordinary um, uh, book on, well, not book, but notes on how to write a book on Machiavelli, that in the, the first element that we must actually acknowledge is they really do exist rulers and ruled, leaders and led. And he, he says that, of course, in the form, formation of leaders, one premise is fundamental. Is it the intention that there should always be rulers and ruled? Or is it the objective to create the conditions in which this division is no longer necessary? But he goes on to say that this is also not just a historical fact. And then he says something which is extremely important for us, that these kinds of divisions are also to be found within social groups that are organized themselves. So that in Gramsci's project to produce a proletarian intellectual who would not be prejudiced against the subaltern, the intellectual is instrumentalized. It's an extremely long um, argument, which I'll be very happy to lay out. But at any rate, this, uh, this notion, th this would lead me to the problems with alter globalization, the kind of utopianism which you saw not only uh, framed and criticized, not, on, uh, not in a dismissive way in the film, but also stuff that you hear, let's say, from Chico Whitaker, the uh, kind of stuff that you hear from the organizers of the World Social Forum, also remarks like, uh, oh, the, uh, the homeless in Mumbai already know what it is that we should do with world governance, extremely um, extremely sort of benevolent uh, feudal remarks that which have very little truth because they uh, equate the moral outrage of the self-selected self radical and the justified self-interest of the oppressed poor and they d uh, suggest that the two are identical and that is not so. So anyway, I'm not going to go on with all of this. I'm simply going to say, and let me at least put this on the 
on the, on the, um, on the screen, I'm going to say that one of the things that is most wonderful about the uh, Santiago thing, and I, you know, we'll be, I'll be very happy to discuss all the details of it, I just want to go right to the end of the text. One of the things that I really very much like, Ruben Santiago's piece is interesting because it is an account of a failure. Last paragraph. That whole thing is the, is the installation, right? You can, you can read it, right? Or should I read it? Can everybody read it? It's quite big. Okay, so the, it's, re, it's a real effort. The effort is described in detail. The effort takes into account the uh, resident middle class and the, the homeless. It, it begins with the homeless on the, on the ground and so on. It's not something, again, like Sisako. It doesn't mock anything there. The, the, uh, the effort is real, okay? Real effort, but it comes to nothing. And in the last, uh, last paragraph, it's kind of brutally described how it comes to nothing. The whole thing is an installation, not just this, but this thing with its failure and the commentary. How to is here an iteration of how not to, because we get at the end the account of the failure. It's easily gone. And here, the intention, you see, this is sort of, uh, again, one could talk at great length about the conceptuality of this, Clearly, the intention is not for it to fail. The, it, on the other hand, the textuality of the installation takes on board the fact of the failure, and it becomes a kind of example that we can use, because as I say, how to and how not to become an iteration one of the, um, of the other. Iteration, not repetition. You know that a repetition is repetition is the same but an iteration is a repetition with an alteration, right? And the lesson is in the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. So we could actually go on with this at great length. I've given you an outline. The part that I really have not read is the part that is a critique of, uh, of alter globalization. But um, otherwise, at least I talked about the other texts as best I could. So I hope that this is a... Um, an appropriate place to just end, and then I also hope that you will have questions that we can discuss together. Thank you. don't want you to look at that thing. It's very distracting. Thank you very much, Professor Spiller. That was a really interesting and uh, thought-provoking presentation from which I hope we pull a lot, a lot of things. So as you know, many of you who have attended the caucus before, this is really the opportunity to start thinking of questions that we really encourage and actively want a debate with everybody here. Um, I have to come back to that uh, very quick, early, uh, perhaps, question that you threw out or provocation, which was, uh, I hope I don't misquote, I tried to write it down as quickly as possible, that if art has become an active space, you will ignore the world. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about this idea of, uh, and I wonder if it's a little bit a, a sort of iteration or indeed a, a thinking upon a lot of things we've been thinking about in the caucus, uh, which might be about the idea of, of where we define or where cultural space becomes a kind of safety valve for, for the political, and where or where it might actually be a kind of profoundly important space to, to kind of imagine things. Let me uh, go back to Gramsci, if I may. I'm very much in Gramsci right now. Um, the last notebook, of course, everybody knows about Gramsci, right? I was actually in Britain at a university where people didn't really know, and I had to give a little uh, potted summary of the guy who died in jail, had spinal TB and so on. Anyway, he died in jail. But in the last notebook, Notebook 29, he's talking about his... Um, about uh, Sardinian as a language, right? Earlier he had said that one should really learn the big national languages because if you just remained focused on the dialect, you would not be able to go beyond into the, and he was himself Sardinian, as you know, not, not from the poorest classes like Du Bois, from uh, 
from a racially um, uh, disenfranchised group, but from a good class position. Both Du Bois, du Bois was from a better class position than Gramsci, but nonetheless, they were okay. So he's talking about he's talking about the dialects, and he's talking about normative grammars and uh, immanent grammars. Immanent grammars being parole, and normative grammars being longer. And then he says, okay, let's go into historical grammar. And he says, well, all historical grammars have to be comparative because one language wins. So one dialect, and he's thinking about Dante, of course. And it seems to me that we use the word art, but the, uh, when one begins to look at what has come, and don't, we cannot forget that this is enabled by the entire kind of corporatist culture that allows the European Union to offer funds. Here we are in a city more or less run by Philips. The, and the uh, 300,000 people, 30,000 workers. Now, in this kind of situation, it seems to me that the kind of um, permission that is given in our, this is what I was criticizing at the end, in our fundraising culture, with a word like art, it, it seems to me that that kind of allowing you to think through, it, it, there used to be a word for this in the 60s, which we have forgotten, a phrase, which is repressive tolerance. So it does seem to me that there we have to think about whether it would be possible to do any of this if there were not the guarantee given by, I understand that people here have been talking about Europe wanting to redefine itself by forgetting its colonial past. I don't think so. This is the colonial past. The, in fact, there are people working, I mean, displaced into something else. The, the, the colonial past did a lot of good things, you know, it, and uh, it was an enabling violation. It's the same story over again, displaced into because territorial imperialism would be a liability now, you know, since the middle of the last century. Territorial imperialisms, are, in fact, they were often an economic liability anyway. It's not necessary to do it that way anymore. It doesn't, I think it would be a mistake to think that Europe is expunging its colonial past. Europe is replaying its colonial past another way. And the class that Robert Reich has called a secessionist class from the global south, who don't re who are very interested in culture, but who don't really have a home and are constantly providing alibis for themselves, and I'm not going to name names, the, you know, that class comes forward to oblige as I was saying in the case of World Social Forum. There are millions of people in the world who have no idea what uh, art means. If we want to confine this to the European alternative capitals and the museums, or the North America, or uh, elite places in the Johannesburg and Delhi, and you know, places like Beijing and, uh, and uh, so on, then it's cool. But it's if we really want to think seriously about whether the word art can even mean anything if you're not speaking one of the European languages. And I'm not talking about there not being translations. They're perfectly fine translations used by, you know, like people like me. If I were giving a talk in, uh, in uh, in Bengali, as I often do, I could certainly use for fine arts, Lolit, Lolit Kala, for, then for conceptual art, uh, Kala, Shilpo, Shanskriti. There are lots of words. It's not a problem of translation because, after all, it's not like the rest of the world is silent. But if you were really talking about uh, working with the, uh, the world's disenfranchised, the idea of art as in this way and the museum, I don't think would. I think in the Cork uh, thing, I said something about my mum in the Louvre, didn't I? So I won't repeat it, but it was uh, quite uh, interesting to me to see my mother, who was certainly not, a, not an uneducated person or an unsophisticated person or an unintelligent person. In many ways, she was very much more intelligent than I could hope to be, but uh, how she reacted to a European museum because of her complete lack of experience of the connection of the museum and the colonial past, and now the colonial present and future. Now, that because you're not 
recording from elsewhere, but you're supposedly bringing, as they say in New York, the barrio into the museum. If I may not quote, because these are words that I have used before, if I may not quote a nice man, I would say it's not to face an inconvenient truth. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the barrio is not brought into the museum so easily. But so that's what I was trying to say. You ignore the world. You define it in terms of a, a circuit. And I'm not censoring what you do. I'm just saying one mustn't claim these kinds of uh, world-saving claims. I certainly we should do what we can. I mean, after all, look at Noam Chomsky. He's teaching at MIT. And I'm sitting here talking. I'm a university professor at Columbia interested in funds raised, etc. Not a problem. But the claim is not for you, it's for art itself. Mm -hmm. I think one should uh, think uh, not just twice, but many, many times before one says it has become, and if one wants to say it, then specify it under the auspices of the European Union. And it's wise choice of a cultural capital every two years or three years or whatever, it is possible for us to make art an open space in the situation of European migration. Even there, there would be criticism. But um, at least that's something. But I don't think you want to make a statement that big. Because art, you know, like literature, it's a terrible word. <laughs> you know, untranslatably European. Thank you. I'd like to really open it almost immediately out to the floor. We have, uh, I would hope, at least uh, a half an hour to 40 minutes. So please, please ask some questions. There are microphones everywhere here. Oh, come on. I know you've done it before. It's always slow to start. I don't mind, actually. That's OK. I'll rest, I'll, rest, I'll rest my voice. I, and you see, it's also my field work, isn't it? Since I talk all over the world, I see where I draw crowds, where I get questions, who is bored, who is uh, dismissive, who looks like they're learning something, who gives me a look like they've heard it all. So it's really, truly also field work. It tells me something about cultural politics. So don't worry about it if you have no questions. I'll go to dinner. <laughs> I'm not giving up so easy, though. It's, I don't think we're going to get a discussion. I think we should just call it off. So I, I, I thank you for listening to me. I'm sorry that you're not interested in the alter global. No, Beatrice, hold on a sec. Here we go. <laughs> I promise it just takes a while. Then maybe this would, um, until now, be too open of a question, but maybe if you could talk a bit about some of what you were not going to talk about um, in the talk in terms of uh, alter globalization. I was going to talk more in detail about attack, which has, um, you know, as I said, that it was, uh, it was a, it was a, um, uh, not, they, uh, Robert Cassens gave uh, an interview in New, to New Left Review in 2003, which some of you might have read where he claims, and, and, and then it's a well-known fact, it's in all of the little books that they bring out, that uh, when Le Monde Diplomatique uh, decided that there should be, and I think it's a wonderful thing, that there should be one part of Le Monde which should be more political, and they thought of doing, and what is it called now? It's called the Association, uh, uh, Taxation Tobin is in there, Association pour le Tax Tobin, pour l'aide aux citoyens. That's what it's called. And you know what the Tobin tax is? The Tobin tax is a tax on foreign exchange um, uh, transactions. Yeah? And of course, that's finance capital. And that's, I think, a fantastic thing, because that's what globalization is, after all. The fact that it makes possible all kinds of cultural, uh, strange cultural juxtapositions, that everything is done at great speed, etc. These are all wonderful things, and we should note it. But globalization is the fact that 
uh, at, and I talked about this uh, at Cork, that capital can move at the speed of light, and so therefore the uh, finance capital turns around now 37 times um, more in a day than world trade. So the fact that Atak wanted to put a, put a tax on this was wonderful. But then, uh, first of all, that's great. But secondly, Atak does not have to worry about the incredible linguistic diversity in the world, which the World Social Forum should worry about. And I talked about, I mean, in, the, in the talk, there is, a, there is a, an invocation of when the non-governmental organizations, basically the international civil society, becomes, uh, becomes um, so strong that it can take over questions of world governance. That's where they're at right now. And that was 1994, quite recently, when the United Nations in Cairo opened the NGO Forum. We were all just blown away. My God, an NGO Forum in the United Nations. Unthinkable. Okay, And it was a, a um, co conference on population control, right? It was a conference on development, the ICPD, population and development, right? International conf conference. And so on the occasion of reproductive uh, heteronormativity, and we had, I had gone to that one again from Bangladesh, because although I'm not a Bangladeshi, the national language of India, I don't really know that well. I mean, I know it, it's my national language, Hindi, but uh, I'm a Bengali speaker, so we share a, uh, share a mother tongue, right? Bangladesh and the part of India that I come from. And so from there, I began talking about the need to access lingual memory if we are really going to get into, I mean, talk about art being open, if we really want to get into access the oppressed rather than sort of top-down do-gooding with interpreters. And I gave some accounts of uh, what happens when this kind of thing happens. That was one. Then two was that, and then I talked a great deal about Gramsci's plans, but two was also this business of uh, Tobin tax. If you draw a tax, a tax is to sustain a polity. It's not just a fund to dip into in order to solve problems. And so the idea was that the, what Gramsci would call, we need some Jacobins. Who were the Jacobins? The Jacobins were, of course, Robespierre, it's terror, and so on and so forth. But the Jacobins were called Jacobins because they were in that uh, house uh, of the Dominicans, right? And they, that's Saint-Jacques, right? It was just a Jacobin, that's a nickname. But they were called the friends of the Constitution. So they were interested in producing a collective will and constitutionality. So to an extent, what I say toward the end of the thing is how we need the abstract state structure. And we need to, as a structure of redress, perhaps regional, in the global south, in order to fight this idea that there is a level playing field and it is post-national. This is a meretricious idea. On the other side, on the other hand, we have to keep on working hard, especially feminists, to keep the state structure clear of nationalism. And there is an entire argument about, you know, this is why this, you know, Dutch, French, it's all very cool, but one has to undo Westphalia in a certain sense. We undo the Enlightenment in that sense, not in every sense. And so that idea that you keep it clear of nationalism also brings me into a discussion of nationalism that it tries to tap what is the underived private, the underived private, not derived from a public. In other words, at the beginning of how you define the human, it's not even an affect. It's almost an animal comfort in one's corner, one's fire hydrant, one's church door, one's something like this. That, that thing, that kind of bottom line affect, which is almost not an affect, is mobilized in order to become the public sphere so that, in fact, nationalism can never have a rational, um, a place in the rational abstractions of the state, although it always does. And I'm with Hannah Arendt there. The nation state is not a necessary connection. And I'm with Gramsci there that language is not necessarily 
an identifier of a nation. I mean, if one works with Africa, one knows this very well. So those were some of the points that I make in that, in that essay. But I will say that the left, the European left, is not ready to listen to this anymore. They are much happier with the idea of uh, you know, these, um, these uh, problem-solving circuits, etc. And there are many in the north, in the south, who would give them that comfort. This message, which is really a left message, the one that I'm giving, is really uh, thinking about the possibility. And then one can really say, the internationale mm -hmm. will save the human race. <laughs> That's a very different kind of thing from this, from this um, because you, you got that poem, from very different kind of thing from this immature and premature and interested and either ignorant, sanctioned ignorance or um, a deep capitalist idea of saving the world quickly uh, by this kind of self-selected uh, moral entrepreneurship. So that's the whole huge thing. But um, it's undoubtedly going to come out one of these days. If you're really interested, you, you'll see it. Okay. I wonder, I, immediately I was sparked by your discussion about feminism mm. and this idea of how feminism might be a way of undoing or thinking the, the nation state. And, I'm wondering if it is part of the European left that's not listening anymore, the potential of kind of feminism within the left and how disappointing that's been in propagating certain important arguments. That is so true. They just expect women and queers to talk in this way. Mm -hmm. You know, they really do not think that there is anything that, on the other hand, the other side knows very well that in the name, I mean, I mentioned, I think, in the Cork Caucus also, the, I, that book, Gregory Massell's book, did I not? The Surrogate Proletariat, where, you know, he's a rightist, but he describes, he was a Sovietologist, he described how in, the, in Central Asia it was easier for uh, the Sovietization to take the women rather than the men, okay? Now this particular thing of the, uh, of the malleability of women and the uh, pliability of women and the, um, uh, the idea of uh, saving women, boy, I wrote that sentence a long time ago, but that sentence was uh, really written because I was ignorant, but no one notices that uh, remark. Let's not go there. But anyway, this, this idea, the idea of uh, women being such an alibi, it's something that uh, the left, on the other hand, doesn't really look at as an important issue because they don't see the alibi nature. They just see this still as the woman and uh, connected to it slightly, the queer question. Okay, so they will be nice and polite and some not even that. You know, but at, at the base of their convictions is the, the idea that this is not really important enough when it comes to changing the world. And I think that's really uh, meretricious. But on the other hand, when I said feminists will be good at the work, I mean, not necessarily all. I mean, feminists are not a monolith. But there is a, there is a way in which Feminism and nationalism have not always been. Sometimes they have. Some, in my mother's generation, she was a member of the All India Women's Congress against, against the, against, I mean, in the interest of national liberation, yes. But we are not talking national liberation anymore today. We are, the, that's the, one of the problems with post-colonial theory, that it's tied to theories of national liberation. The situation where there is intense national oppression is Palestine. But the solution to that situation is not through the old colonial, anti-colonial national liberation um, uh, movements at all. It's not Algeria or India, that model that's going to do anything in Palestine. And that, so that to an extent, we, uh, although women were, and women in fact in the Palestinian situation are corralled into nationalism, as we know, this is one of the problems, but on the other hand, when one is not so pushed by the violence in, the, in, the, in one's life into not being able to think about such redress, it is women who, have not, who can question nationalism in many ways because Reproductive heteronormativity is bigger than imperialism. Both sides have, have these beliefs. Both the imperialists 
and the colonized. So to an extent, that begins just as Kafka, in his way, was able to say that there is a double bind between positive law and natural law, so can, in another way, analogically, the feminists see that there is a deep double bind between reproductive heteronormativity, which is an older, broader, more uh, global thing. As I say, it's a tacit globalization without, before the silicon chip, centuries before the silicon chip, because it's internalized. That stuff, that's why I think they can. On the other hand, at the bottom, where people are doing redress for gender, that's where there is no alternative to deep language learning. It takes a long time. As I say, it's not convenient, but you cannot access gendering. You cannot access gendering. You can only reduce it, and I'm not talking about Alexonic Europe, because in the Alexon Alex even there, that may be true. In, but in the European situation, there is at least a desire to change Europe so that you see uh, you see the, the foulard saying, Francaise musulmane. Now that's a, that's a thing, that's a, that's a different kind of movement I'm talking about, because the, the, uh, the, the gendered, alexonic, underclass migrant has already come a long way. But if one thinks about the world, there is no way that one will think re gender redress without language learning, no way. You can solve problems, but are we talking about solving problems or working toward a just world? This is a very old, very old thematic of mine. Those of you who read me in the 70s, I wrote even then about against sexism and for feminism. One can expand that one. So that's, that's my take on gender. Thank you. Some questions? Okay, we have over here. Um, thank you for your extremely inspiring lecture. I was intrigued by the opening that you gave us about the dead dog and your intertextual weaving into other texts. And I wanted to know whether you have a, an ending for that because you left it somehow suspended for us in suspense and whether you can see that as a extreme form of subalternity of beyond... The dog, you mean? Be yes, the deck dog, beyond the healers, beyond women. What is the reading that you wanted to give us of the dead dog? Well, it's Kafka, as I said, it's intertextual. I don't think, uh, because it's absurd. I mean, there's no reason why this guy. I mean, there's no like logical uh, significance of the, looking at the dead dog of all things. I mean, uh, and I should actually say that the person who first pointed it out to me was an undergraduate student. I told Emma that I would give her a footnote and I forgot her name. Emma Kaufman, incredibly smart young person. Okay, she, I was teaching Kafka and she says to me, ah, Professor Pivak, but have you noticed Bamako opens it? That I say, Emma, you're right. And I began to think. No, I don't think it's an extreme form of subalternity. I'll tell you why. I mean, it could be. Anything could be anything. But the subalternity is, sub subalternity is, um, is um, defined on a, a social, a socio political structure. Eh? And I think what, because the subaltern in my neck of the woods, I mean, you can, you, if you use the word subaltern simply to mean anyone who is the victim of racism or, you know, anything, that's fine. You know, I'm not a custodian of uh, correct language use. But the way in which I use it is to indicate the persons who are detached from lines of social mobility. This is a, this is a kind of uh, already structured situation, yeah? So I think it would be to anthropomorphize the dog, to think that the dog stands for an extreme form of subalternity. And I think that's the line that uh, James Kutsia takes. I don't know to show what, but the, um, Subaltern, I, I thought that the, at the beginning, the dead dog, 
uh, watched by this guy, seen by this guy. And at the end, that very guy killing himself, when that, the story is not really about him. I mean, it is true he loses his wife, who goes off to, to uh, who's the singer. But that's really not a very big story. It did look like, as I said, textual signals rather than narrative signals. You know, you will forgive me for using this vocabulary. When in 1966, a very long time ago, Barthes' essay on the structural analysis of narrative, which is a fantastic essay, it has lasted the test of time. When it came out in Communication, I was a second year assistant professor. It was like being hit, in, hit, hit on the head with a hammer. It was so unusual. And this distinction between textual and narrative, storyline, this really comes from there. So, it's, so that's what I think it is. Let me just give you one example of um, subalternity in this sense. These are examples I've used before. There are others one can use. Okay, the, one of them is, perhaps I even use them in the Cork Caucus, who knows. One of them is this human rights, um, human rights victory that we, we won. I was part of that public interest litigation in Calcutta in 2000. The first time at the High Court, for the first time in human history, uh, 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 an Aboriginal, won, uh, on behalf, we litigated on behalf of uh, this man's wife. He had been uh, killed in custody, okay? And we really celebrated. But the thing is that the police in that area where I had one of my schools, this, uh, of course, nobody uh, did any follow-up. And because it was too remote, right? They destroyed the village, and they did not take this defeat as they perceived it lying down. So to this day, I don't know now what's happened because the local landowner closed the schools and gave it over to the corporate sector, which is why I'm not so happy about the corporate sector making it possible for you to open up art. But at any rate, the, uh, the, I don't know what's happening. But at any rate, then, every three months or so, the guy who had really been uh, who had really been accused from the, uh, the police in the local area, in the village area, was a Brahmin Hindu. Uh, he would, unless he was, something was done to him, the case was not closed, right? Nothing could happen. And he, every month and a half or so, the court would call these um, people from the little hamlet to go there because he was coming. And he would never come. So the woman who went, because she was kind of the head of the village, who was, who was um, illiterate, couldn't read what the buses said, etc., had to take my teacher with her. She lost a day's day labor wages. I had to close the school because my teacher had to go to m uh, manipulate all of this. They always came back because he didn't show. This is subalternity. No access to the lines of social mobility. So that's one. And the other is when a woman from another little village came and asked me to speak to the panchayat, which is the smallest unit of local self-government, works quite well in West Bengal, because her own son was, uh, was uh, really oppressing women to the extent of pulling them with, uh, by their hair along while they're screaming away. And she came running to me and said, look, this is the third woman he's done it to complain against him. Nobody listens to anybody, anything we say. You who are in the world. I went and spoke to the panchayat and I said, look, I've got it from the woman and I would like something to be done. The village is really harmed. And I was told by this very good person, you know, domestic violence is not an issue among the tribals. You can't take it up with the tribals. It's really, you know, because of course they need to be bus drivers, isn't that? They need to be brought up to be casual labor. Domestic violence, which requires a different kind of episteme, belongs to the middle class. And so I was simply shut up. I was told, no, you can't uh, do anything about domestic violence among the tribals. No, that's really not appropriate. And so I was made to feel almost as if I was a foreigner, you know, because, of course, she had spoken to me, although... So that's subalternity. In other words, she actually did speak, but she did not speak, because the, sp the speech act was not completed. And that's a little different from the terrible oppression of animals. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's, that's why I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a question here in the center. Anything from up above? Okay. Chema, just one row down here, yeah.
Yeah, hello. Um, Hi. Yeah, I'm really um, uh, fascinated about uh, your talk. And especially the end of the talk, you have said about uh, um, your yeah, art is untranslatably European. And when I've heard, I thought, yeah, I'm really relieved that someone finally said that because that's what I was feeling, but yeah, I couldn't somehow yeah, express as an art historian. <laughs> and my question is then how can you how can you yeah define the art in the non Western countries? How try can you define it? It's a kind of then a marionette of the West or yeah, I'm curious how you can uh, are you going to uh, define it, and what can we do then? Then can we only be aware of this kind of discrepancy of yeah, your art is European and something yeah, not art but something undefinable, but creative, very close to art in the West happening in the non-Western countries. Yeah. Wonderful, uh, thank you. The, it, was that it? You want more? Yeah. more? Okay. I'm sorry about, I'm a little bit nervous. No, why? This is a very hard question. I, and that, this is the kind of question I want to uh, share the problem with you. I mean, I'm not giving you an answer. You know, I'm, it's, who can answer this question? Let me just begin by saying that I was talking really more about the word art and its various synonyms all over the place. You know, it's like, it, it's a very broad uh, complaint, isn't it? It's a problem, for example, with the gay international. My colleague, Joseph Massad, has written this book called Desiring Arabs, where it's not as if there is no homosexuality in Iran, as Ahmadinejad has famously said. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the fact that it's put in one kind of definition. So I'm not saying that there is no art, because we are speaking in uh, these Western languages here, and so it's, uh, that's fine. And also, now there are two or three things that needs to be said here. My mother, for example, was married at 14 and had my brother when she was 15 years old. But it was not a teenage pregnancy. That's a, a, that's a thing, you know? and. So it, this is the kind of thing that I was talking about. As for uh, also what needs to be said is, and here I'm again quoting Derrida, by whom I'm deeply influenced, modern uh, universities are on the European model. So that when one looks at uh, uh, you know, uh, departments and faculties and books and publishers and so on and so forth, it's Oh, sorry. Be two seconds, I hope. <laughs> what does it say? It's saying that the museum will close in a few minutes. In a few minutes, Not okay. Not for us, though. <laughs> but, um, you see, the, uh, that's, uh, that sort of regulation also. It seems to me that we already are in the shadow of the European Enlightenment, okay? So I, for me, there isn't really a Western and a non-Western, especially non-Western is, come on, what does it mean to say non-Western? I mean, then there are these three huge things, you know, China, India, uh, Egypt, and then you have the, the, those who didn't quite make it in the civilization game. Then how, what is, where is Oceania? Where is anthropology ending and art beginning? So those are different kinds of questions. But I will say that in order to think from inside those kinds of formations, trying to undo, this is why Gramsci says historical grammars are comparative. You cannot just produce art history. And people do all the time. I mean, my South Asian colleagues are producing uh, art, South Asian art history, it's constantly saying, you know, it's not European, it's not European, but in fact legitimizing by reversal. It seems to me that that project, I can't begin to think what that project would look like. It's an impossible thing to think because the sequential history, how would you, in other fields, for example, 
um, uh, Kitty Choudhury has tried in Asia before Europe. He was Brodel's student. Brodel rethought historiography. So perhaps if one begins to rethink historiography in that way, then perhaps I have no idea because I'm not an art historian, but I'm completely sympathetic with the problem, the problem of having to produce. I want to end, this is a very long non-answer, but I want, to end, I want to end with an example, a little story that uh, everybody will understand. I went to see the Swan Lake in New York with my very dear friend Deborah White, who knows much more about ballet than I do. It was fantastic. Okay, so we came out and we are drinking tea and we are talking. And I said, Deborah, you know, if I were Max Weber, an Indian Max Weber, I would say, oh, the Europeans don't have dance. They just have extremely well organized hatha yoga. <laughs> okay? So uh, then, uh, it, th this is the kind of remark that Weber made when he said, India has no uh, philosophy, it has only religion. See, so it's, uh, it's very hard to say how to. Yeah, it's, the novel Native Speaker, which I hope some of you have here read, Chang Re Lee, Korean American. See, it's a fantastic novel because it begins with the attempt to understand his white wife rather than go on and on about being himself misunderstood. He has turned the tables some. See what I'm saying? So I, I cannot, I can only share the problem with you. but. It doesn't mean that we cannot think of something. Um, in the verbal area, we have an easy out. There's language learning. But verité en peinture, that's a very different, very different ball game. So that's, that's you know, just a few ruminations. Take one more question. Ah, yes, Nicolene. Just as as maybe a small question that's related to the previous one. When you mentioned um, the, woman, <clears throat> the woman in disgrace, her strategy for <clears throat> living in the society that you find yourself in, is that something you would suggest us to do or is that a solution you would put into the discussion or? No, novels are not um, uh, blueprints for action. The connection between aesthetics and politics is extremely complicated. So I don't think you can find, I mean, as I say again and again, uh, King Lear is not a prescription for running bareheaded in storms. So uh, no, it's, uh, it's uh, I think one has to read it in the whole context of the production. And then what happens with reading, not just reading text, verbal texts, but all kinds of things, what happens is that you begin to get into the habit of getting into other spaces. And that can become a useful skill to have when you are called upon to do what is called activism, when the ethical calls you. I don't think that I, I want James Kutsia to tell me what to do, no. I want to read his novel so that I am made more fine, so that then something else can happen to me. It's a, and you know, when one learns a language, for example, so often the languages of the rest of the world are learned in order to have proficiency. You know, I'm going to China, I'm getting a job in Africa and so on. One should, from this point of view, this is a completely impractical thing I'm saying, but you say art has opened up as an active space. Why can't I say an act, uh, impractical thing? <laughs> One should learn a language finally with an idea of being able to read whatever is like poetry in that language. Poetry itself is not something that you can name. Aristotle does not name poetry. so. This is something that, like art, it's a word which has a history. But again, quoting Gramsci, all historical study must be comparative in that sense because things win. So things, a certain way of looking wins so that one should, in fact, look at the winning of certain models of art hist history 
and it, their opposition being legitimize, le legitimization by reversal, and then begin to think, is there another way, or is it gone? Is it historically obliterated? Because it's also true that certain possibilities die historically. It's not possible to bring some things back. And to pretend to have brought them back is either foolish or knavish. So that's, that's what I would say in that, in that case. No, not that you go to these books in order to really, I mean, even, even to take Marxism as a blueprint for action was, I believe, a mistake. The, I mean, Marx himself, if I may suggest this, and again, I may have said this at the Cork Caucus, because these are things that stay with me. In the critique of the Gotha program, he was incredibly cross and annoyed with the kinds of mistakes that we make every day with, his, with what he said. He was very, very cross that mistakes had been made. I think it's a different kind of proposition. How we learn from these kinds of texts, do we follow them uh, to, in detail? What do we do with them? How do we read them? That's another, another discussion. It's a discussion I really hope we, we keep on and on with, keep troubling. Uh, Professor Spivak, I would like to thank you so much for the, your presentation and for the, your generous uh, answering of our questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Perhaps we could have a moment to have a drink together in the cafe and we Wonderful. could perhaps have a few more Wonderful. questions for you, those who yes. didn't manage But uh, promise already. not to ask me very difficult questions, okay? <laughs> Just easy questions. Okay, only simple questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. My pleasure.